You're listening to The Luxury Item, the podcast on the business of luxury and the people and companies that are shaping the future of the luxury industry. Here's your host, Scott Kerr. When it comes to high-end audio equipment, few companies have cornered the market quite like Macintosh Group. The group has been a leader and innovator in the premium and luxury auto category for decades and today manufactures and globally distributes some of the world's finest amplifiers, speakers, turntables, and other audio products. Macintosh Group's portfolio includes its legendary home audio flagship brand Macintosh and prestigious Italian speaker manufacturer Sonus Faber, as well as esteemed audio brands Rotel, Project Audio Systems, and Sumiko Fono, all catering to a highly loyal base of affluent audio enthusiasts and music lovers. Overseeing this iconic collection of brands is my guest on the luxury item, Daniel Pigeon, Chief Executive Officer of Macintosh Group. Daniel joined Macintosh Group as CEO in 2022, coming from Sears Home Services, where he also served as CEO and led a nationwide organization of 7,000 employees. Prior to that, Daniel was the founder and chairman of Star Power, a luxury brand electronics retailer and custom installation services company based in Dallas, Texas. He had been chairman of the executive board for Consumer Technology Association, the producer of the largest trade show in the world, the Consumer Electronics Show, and currently serves on CTA's executive board. Welcome to the luxury item, Daniel. Thank you. So glad to be here. So the Macintosh Group is a leader in the premium audio space and is the parent company to the iconic American Macintosh audio brand, as well as the prestigious Italian speaker manufacturer, Sonus Faber. The Macintosh Group distributes products for high-end audio manufacturers like Project and Rotel, supplies high-end in-car audio solutions to the likes of Jeep and Maserati, and owns a handful of high-end audio distributors. And that's a big footprint in the premium audio space. But you have a lot of great brands as part of this portfolio. So what is what is the Macintosh Group's bigger mission as a company? As a group, we aim to bring the very best audio products and sound quality uh, to not only our loyal audiophiles, but also a growing group of music lovers uh, across the world. So it's fairly simple, right? Look, as a leader in, in luxury audio, we're focused on setting the standards across our own brands. So as you mentioned, Macintosh Laboratories, uh, Sonus Faber, some distributed brands. Uh, we we want to amplify the reach so that the premium quality sound is accessible to all those that desire. And sometime in 2022, the Macintosh Group was acquired by a Texas-based private equity firm, Highlander Partners. I think a lot of people were surprised by that move. What is the long-term play behind that acquisition? So that's going to be a longer answer than my first answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but quality music audio has an effect on us emotionally and even physically uh, in a way that it's unlike any other luxury product. And so if you look at the years leading up to COVID, I think there was this, this race or this slow decline in audio quality to become the cheapest, most portable way to listen to music. Mm-hmm. And we all sort of just sort of accepted it along the way, you know, convenience over quality. So you know, authentic experiences were not part of the purchase experience. And that was something that was relegated to live concerts and audio systems were sort of deemed old school. So this follows the trend of how most people historically consumed audio. It was either through earbuds or low quality portable speaker systems or something like that. But then COVID came, right? And audio experience, something of a resurgence. And so during the uh, COVID, we all yearned for those real and authentic human experiences. Uh, You know, we needed close interactions again. So we sought something authentic, something real. And playing music in, in, you know, in ways that many people had never heard before sort of impacted people both emotionally and physically. Uh, And that emotional connection to our music is what got many of us through that terrible time of COVID. And so where I'm going with this is, is, you know, where we're at today is once people understood and experienced how good music and film can really be, you know, it's tough to go back. So now to answer your question, Highlander, um, Highlander Group recognized this opportunity to continue unlocking this expanding set of consumers, Uh, people that are not only passionate about their music, but now they're armed with and and understand a better way to listen to that music. So, um, uh, you know, when we first started this process a few years ago, 
It's like, if we're going to enter the space, let's do it with the very best. And that's why Highlander purchased Macintosh Group. Yeah, and the acquisition joined a growing list of big audio companies that have been purchased by private equity groups or other technology companies in recent years. Why, why do you think there was this surging interest in this category? Was it for what you just said? Well, it's, it's exposing to a broader set of potential customers, right? Uh, and so, you know, like any, any good business and private equity included, you know, they want growth opportunities. And uh, this effect on um, luxury audio, if you want to call it, audiophile uh, audio, this, this growing demand sort of uh, warranted um, people to sort of unlock that. And, and Highlander is the perfect you know, company, uh, private equity firm to do that. They've done it in, in so many other occasions and they recognized it. And so that's how we all got together and, and, and decided on Macintosh. I want to focus on the flagship Macintosh brand. Macintosh has been around for 75 years and has a storied reputation in the high-end audio world, known for its powerful audio systems, excellent sound quality, and of course, its distinctive blue watt meters. I think a great place to start is sharing with my listeners a brief history of Macintosh and how it became a favorite among audiophiles and audio enthusiasts. A great question. Um, I would say, you know, we pioneered the hi-fi industry uh, 75 years ago when Macintosh Labs was founded, there really wasn't a hi-fi industry. There was just those like those PA systems that were renowned only for their poor quality. Right. After World War II, uh, Macintosh created amplifiers and Frank Macintosh, the actual founder, decided to create these amplifiers and he had a small second floor office space. And what he created was just a clear sound that had never been, never heard at high volumes before. And uh, obviously the music industry took notice. And the next thing you know, Macintosh amplifiers were being used to power speakers at concerts. And then famously at Woodstock. And then, you know, people wanted to own their own hi-fi system. So what's, what's remarkable is that, you know, even today, the methods that we build the products uh, are, are the same as it was 75 years ago. We build everything by hand. So it's, it's, it's been a really, um, as you said, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a great story. It's, it's excellent sound quality. The, this, this course that, that uh, Macintosh has set out, um, it's become a cornerstone in American culture uh, and been part of plenty of milestones. Uh, and, and, you know, whether it's Lyndon Johnson's inauguration speech to, Woodstock to the famous Grateful Dead uh, wall of sound. Macintosh has not only witnessed history, but you know, we're also a part of it. And in home audio, several brands have withstood the test of time. It seems over the course of its 75 years in existence, Macintosh has stuck pretty close to its purpose and heritage. How has it managed to stay both distinctive and relevant all these years? I think first and foremost, we're, we're one of the only remaining truly American-made brands in audio, and, th- and that's our DNA. And, you know, uh, personally, I've been around this industry my entire life, and there's simply no more iconic company in the performance audio world than Macintosh. Uh, You know, you you think about the the quality, the quality of the product speaks for itself. And, you know, as I'm sure you've noticed, the design of Macintosh specifically has barely changed over 75 years. It's, it's, it's that, that consistency, it's that performance, it's that value. And, and that's why when you, you know, when you purchase a Macintosh product, it, it, it does last a lifetime. I mean, that's not cliche. Uh, it's, it's, we just don't follow this industry of disposable electronics and, and, you know, and foreign made and, and, and mass produced. We're focused on simply making the finest product. And you're still based in Binghamton, New York. That's where the manufacturing facilities are, which you know, are in full swing since the company was founded. How many employees do you have still working there? And what is the average tenure at, at the company? So not surprising. So there's you know, roughly 200 uh, people employed at the factory. Uh, and average tenure is just right under 20 years. So you can imagine that's... Uh, uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable to see, you know, people that have been there 50 years and are, and are still working, uh, sometimes. And it's, it's, it's beautiful to see. And, uh, uh, you know, when, when you go up to Binghamton, it's, it's definitely made, uh, the same way that Macintosh was made 75 years ago. You have second and third generation working there? Oh, for sure. Yes. No, there's, there's several people in, in many parts of the factory. It's, it does, it becomes a family affair. 
Macintosh audio products are expensive, but there is no luxury that comes cheap. But price is not really what makes Macintosh products valuable. Like any successful luxury brand, Macintosh has created the desire for something extraordinary. If you look at Hermes Birkin bag, company will tell you that part of what makes the bag so expensive is the exquisite workmanship. I'm sure many factors contribute to the premium price of Macintosh products. How much does the craftsmanship behind designing and building Macintosh products influence its price? I think it starts with our history. Macintosh really started as a performance brand. I mean, no different than think Ferrari or Lamborghini, Maserati, any of these. Macintosh was first appreciated as that performance brand long before it ever was considered a luxury product. Uh, we wouldn't know how to create a product that wasn't the very best. That's, that's not our DNA. That's not what we do. And it's that high quality that customers have come to expect. And that cost is indic it, you know, sort of indicative of that lifetime investment. So, you know, when we look at crafting a new product at Macintosh, we don't cut corners. Uh, each piece is assembled by hand, as I said, in our factories, just one at a time. It's the same, sort of the same as like, you know, or made uh, Birkin, you know, and, you know, when you're not mass producing a product, yes, there are higher costs associated, but you're also, you understand you're getting the best quality materials available uh, on the market. Uh, and what customers also get in return is equipment that lives in their home for decades. And, you know, it's in Macintosh's case, far more likely to be passed down a generation than to be thrown out. And who do the brands in the Macintosh portfolio appeal to? Is it mostly your classic audiophiles who are pursuing actual high fidelity sound reproduction or wealthy luxury buyers who will spend in the high six or seven figures on audio equipment driven totally by brand name, their love for music and emotions? Can I simply answer yes to that? <laughs> <laughs> no, as, as, as I've said before, I mean, historically, we're, you know, we were a performance brand that appealed to audiophiles. And um, over the years, it expanded to these enthusiasts that are seeking the finest quality um, audio. And today, this is back to you know what we were talking about a bit ago, which is we find ourselves appealing to now a broader group, you know, those people that you know are looking for those moments of escape, and those you know those that value just living in that moment when nothing else matters. Um, and we see consumers yearning for those authentic experiences everywhere. I mean, look at uh, it, it. It's really not different. If you look at other luxury goods or you, you know, you look at live experience, what's happened, the recent phenomena with concerts, it's a real shift in the consumer towards this authentic experience. You know, buying our products makes a statement about who they are and how they value music in their lives. And we, Specifically, as, as Macintosh, we have the additional benefit of delivering extremely powerful experiences, both in music and movies. And that is where, you know, I, I think we distinguish ourselves from other luxury products because we have the additional component of, of adding emotional experience of sound. And you touched about, about this earlier, about the pandemic accelerated the demand for premium audio products. So you were saying, obviously, that was a kind of big turning, a turning point for you as a brand. Were you also seeing an increase in homeowners creating like whole house audio systems? Yes. Now, in, in like, like I touched on it before, uh, COVID created a significant surge in demand, especially because the audience realized, you know, the opportunity to invest in their homes and their, their entertainment and their, their budgets were, were sort of adjusted accordingly because people were still earning income and, and they weren't spending on travel and dining experiences in entertainment and so they could redirect those monies but it was you know it was also a time when consumers decided to invest in their own hobbies and passions so investing in a quality sound system became top of mind and in whole house as you mentioned whole house audio systems because people were living in their homes more uh, those custom installation um, uh, sort of products trended up during covid because Back to what I was saying earlier, people were really seeking these genuine listen experiences. You know, they couldn't go to concerts, they couldn't hear live music, and they wanted they wanted that same connection to the music. And so, you know, fortunately for us, post pandemic, uh, we're seeing this trend continue, and and you know, it's expanding into 
where people are. Cause you know, once you've experienced it, uh, you don't want to give that up. Uh, that's something that you want to, you want to keep experiencing. And in the same vein, the super yacht and private jet industries also enjoyed the pandemic tailwind. Were you doing more onboard yacht and jet audio system installations in that period? So it's, you know, there's a longer lead time, but the answer is yes. We, we, we've seen a surge in that. Our, we have a, a, a very robust, um, you know, uh, yacht, marine, jet business that is continuing to, to grow for us. So we're seeing that trend uh, in people's recognition of, oh, look, this is where I am. This is where I want that experience. So we're definitely seeing more and more customers seeking out those systems. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to continue to see that grow. Well, concert sound isn't your core business. Macintosh carved a name for itself in the history of modern music. 50 years ago, Macintosh amplifiers powered the Grateful Dead's legendary Wall of Sound show at the San Francisco Cal Palace. It's probably the most unique traveling concert sound system in history. And to describe the sound system for listeners, imagine going to a concert and you're facing the stage, looking at a concert system comprised of over 600 speakers arranged on a towering three-story tall, 100-foot wide wall behind the stage. How did the partnership with the Grateful Dead come about and whose idea was it to create this groundbreaking sound system? Yeah, it's funny. That's one of the, that, when I first uh, joined uh, a couple of years ago, I, I wanted to, to know those stories. So I'm, I'm happy to share that. Um, it started with Bill Hanley of Hanley Sounds. Uh, he was one of the pioneers of high quality sounds for concerts. Uh, the first really to apply the standards of hi-fi audio to live gigs. So he was behind the uh, Newport Jazz Festival, Woodstock, you know, both of those huge Macintosh. And he was also the one who told the Grateful Dead uh, they just had to use Macintosh uh, if they wanted the best. And so their lead designer, Osley um, Bear Stanley, had uh, the vision for the wall of sound. And he, along with the team of engineers, brought that to life. And once the dead, you know, Grateful Dead heard the difference. They and they weren't turning back either. So Grateful Dead, uh, as you can imagine, was one of the premier acts of the 1970s. And it, they moved from smaller venues to these huge arenas. Um, and those strains on the on the Hall Stadium capacity, mm -hmm. you know, was on those conventional PA equipment. So they 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 couldn't that wasn't going to fit with what they were trying to achieve. So they built their own. And um Yes, it would be loud, but it would also be clear. And that's where we entered in. We were able to bring products that, that offered that undistorted, clear sound. Uh, and it was one of the first times in a concert of, of that size, and I'm talking about the Grateful Dead, um, where the issue was that, you know, you could hear that music clearly no matter where you were in the in the, in the stadium or, or right. in the venue. And so... Um, you know, it, 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 it's actually, if you look closely, um, it wasn't placed at the front of the stage like most of the speakers that you'll, you'll see. It was actually placed behind right. uh, the musicians. Mm -hmm. And that was something because the, it was, you know, a system that needed no sound, uh, sound man. Because the band, the, the individual band members could literally mix the sound from the stage and each musician got to control both levels of, the, the instrument and the vocal levels themselves. So that was really unique and, and pioneering at the time. Did any other bands try to replicate that? Because I, I mean, the Grateful Dead is really the only one that I know of. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm sure there have been. None come to mind uh, when I think about it, but you know, Macintosh products, uh, oftentimes they, they don't tell us when they get used, but they do get used quite often. We usually find out about it when we see it in a, in a, in a poster or a, or a video. I want to talk a little bit about the way people have consumed music over the years through the decades as the way people consume music changed and Macintosh evolved with new products. But if you look at the late 1990s with the wave of digital music that rushed in with the launch of the Apple's iPod, it was the first major innovation that represented a significant step backward in terms of fidelity and sound quality in exchange for the incredible convenience and portability of large music libraries, users accepted the MP3 compression format. People were willing to put thousands of songs on their portable player at the expense of audio quality. 
this low quality format even carried over to the first wave of streaming services of Apple Music and Amazon, Spotify. How did the iPod and other portable MP3 players, along with the major shift in the way people were listening to downgraded sound quality music throughout the day, impact your business playbook? So when people are listening to low quality sound on a daily basis, um, they don't know what high quality sound sounds like until they actually hear it. So to your point, that's our challenge, but it's also our opportunity. So, it, you know, at no time in history has music been so accessible. And uh, I, I, I don't know your age, but I'm of the age when, you know, we started with vinyl albums, remember the launch of CDs and even laser discs. And well, I guess it has changed. On the other hand, it's created so many more people that are passionate about music and sound uh, because now music is, is at their fingertips. And um, that's something we can win, win with. We innovate products that take streaming services into account and make all sorts of modern technology sound much better. But we're also true to our analog heritage, uh, which, um, you know, we can actually get life to sort of slow down. And our products get consumers to just sit down and, and just let something like a vinyl album just overtake them. And it, I know it sounds sort of fanciful, but it's actually something that is attainable, you know, that moment and that time. And it, it's hard to explain unless you've actually experienced it. Which kind of leads me to the breakthroughs in the quality of car sound systems. You know, during the 1980s, you approached the capabilities of, of these home audio setups. Most of the advancements in the car audio industry occurred in the aftermarket rather than through the stock systems. But Macintosh didn't really expand its stereo systems to cars and motorcycles until the 1990s and early 2000s. Why was that when the 1980s was really the sort of the heyday, if you will, of car sound systems? So uh, good question. Clarion actually purchased Macintosh in the 1990s. And uh, the distinct purpose was for for capitalizing on the market you just described that, you know, that that heavy use in the 80s and 90s. Um, because they wanted to introduce better quality audio inside the car. And they did that successfully. And they looked at it as a, as a gateway product. And then, you know, as, as we look today, um, believe it or not, we still have some of the same engineers that, that introduced those original car audio systems, and they work on the new car audio systems today. So being inside cars is a strategically it's a great way for us to open up conversations by demonstrating unmatched audio in a vehicle um and you know that that sort of makes sense as a strategy because it's something like 60 percent of all audio is consumed inside of a car so as far as like why did they wait so long i i think you know macintosh is is not typically a company that you know jumps ahead of itself uh, and uh, waits for opportunities, and, and Clarion obviously capitalized on that opportunity beginning in the 90s. And if you fast forward to 2020, Macintosh debuted its first luxury car audio system in almost 20 years, pairing with Jeep and for its Grand Wagoneer concept, and then the Grand Cherokee L models. Aside from being a very American automobile brand, why did you feel Jeep was the right brand match for Macintosh as opposed to a Cadillac or a Lincoln? We're, we're very thoughtful about all of our auto partnerships. Um, specifically, we look for synergies within our brands. And um, you, I, I know we've been talking Macintosh, but you'll see Sonos Faber inside of Maserati, for example. And um, a couple of weeks ago, we just announced that we'll be inside of the new Lamborghinis. Uh, for Macintosh, as you mentioned, we have the specific Jeep models uh, on there. And so... When Jeep was launching the Wagoneer concept, we saw that as a pioneer product, and uh, we felt that it was, uh, it, and it turned out to be pushing the boundaries of like what a luxury SUV could be, and we wanted to be part of that. Obviously, beyond the American heritage uh, and whatnot, it was a, a, a really good partnership with Jeep that continues today, and so both both brands benefit from sort of elevating the audio experience inside the vehicle. And it's also introducing us to a new set of consumers that we'll find in Jeep, Lamborghini, and Maserati, and, and more on the way. It's the same idea. So the concept is that two best-in-class brands are working together, and audiophiles and autophiles have similar taste profiles. 
and it, it, it makes it a very natural partnership. You said before, you recently announced the Italian hi-fi brand Sonus Faber is collaborating with the Italian luxury car maker Lamborghini on a unique sound system, especially designed for its plug-in hybrid sports car, the Ray Welto. Can you talk a little bit about that partnership? So obviously they were seeking, uh, a, you know, higher audio performance inside of, of the car. And it's, it's, it is somewhat unique because if you think about uh, the challenge of a of a roaring engine like that and providing the 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 right audio experience to sort of complement um, what you hear from from the engine. Yeah, uh, it was quite a technological feat, and uh, there are, are people um, uh, that team actually in Vicenza, Italy, uh, really an incredibly talented group, uh, similar to what's in Binghamton with with the automotive experience they have. But they really came up with a solution that, that like I said, complemented the sound of the car's engine rather than just sort of overtook it or was was not a very good experience inside the vehicle. And uh, Lamborghini's excited about it. We're obviously excited about it. And uh, we're going to continue. So is leaning heavier in the car audio category part of a bigger strategy to build awareness of the portfolio of Macintosh brands to younger customers? I think it's, it's about balance, right? I, I don't see us ever becoming like a car audio company it's where it works it works where it doesn't it doesn't i i think for us the opportunity to open up and expand that customer base that they're serving makes a whole lot of sense uh but we'll, we'll be careful with it it's 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 something that we take very very seriously and that, you know above all it it has to fit to you know the core culture of our, of our of our company and what we stand for. So last month, I had the privilege of getting a personalized tour of the new Macintosh Group's House of Sound here in the Chelsea neighborhood of New York City. The House of Sound is an 11,000 square feet multi-level townhouse showcasing a range of state-of-the-art audio systems made up of a selection of the Macintosh Group's high-end components. Lots of different listening rooms and spaces, a giant home theater, a garage for your Macintosh fitted Jeep Wagoneer and a hot tub, of course. Why did you create the House of Sound in the first place? Well, it wasn't for the hot tub. <laughs> hot tub time <laughs> machine, right? Yeah, no, the, the House of Sound represents, it's a revolutionary approach, sort of showcasing the latest audio innovations from Macintosh Group. Um, we don't sell it out of that location and, and have no plans to do so. So it's for our dealers along with potential buyers, media influencers, um, and, and more are sort of finding the house of sound and, and, and they're frequenting the house of sound. And it's all with the aim of learning about our brands, uh, learning about these setups and, you know, elevating the experience and inspiration on how these systems can materialize in, in inside of a consumer's home. The goal of the house of sound is simply just, immerse visitors into a symphony of you know, sound, art, design. And in, in, in the house has this additional function as an experiential showroom that just represents the pinnacle of luxury in everything we do. Well, I can't have a conversation without talking about AI. Artificial intelligence has been used in the audio industry for years. AI audio software allows audio professionals to restore and enhance damaged audio, remove background noise, etc. Music streaming platforms like Spotify use AI to create customized playlists based on a user's listening habits. Even recently, we saw the Beatles release one final record with the help of artificial intelligence extracting John Lennon's voice from an old now and then demo. Has Macintosh embraced artificial intelligence in any way? We are still very much an artisan company. Um, AI has been and will continue to be part of the conversation, but you know, today it's mostly used for our planning and research. Um, you know, that being said, AI does have some applications within the audio world itself. You know, as it's used in different ways before it gets to our product. So, for example, like enhancing the media quality or removing background noises, et cetera. But, you know, right now our focus is just producing the best sound possible and, and we don't need AI to do that. So looking ahead, what advancements can we expect from Macintosh in the coming years that will lead the next generation of audio technology and enhancing our listening experiences? So we, we know we have opportunities to incorporate and, every step of the listening journey, uh, whether, you know, at home or on the move, we do want to broaden our base of customers, as I mentioned before, and, and it requires us to be there in different ways 
where people are enjoying music. So without, without giving away too much of our roadmap, we're looking at all sorts of possibilities, but we're very focused right now on adding more rooms to the home. You mentioned that earlier in the, in the COVID uh, discussion where people are enjoying music in, in, in more rooms of their home. Uh, you know, one example of that is, is, you know, our custom installation products, our, our new, uh, you know, our new home theater products. Uh, it is definitely the fastest growing part of our company. And, um, you know, we have a, a lot of new products uh, coming also for like first purchase sort of engagements where people mm-hmm. can, can, can buy from us and, and out of the box, they have that first interaction or that first experience with us and then uh, you know last but not least we just spoke about it the the automotive and marine partnerships um are are very important to us as well it just continues to expose our brand to the to, to the right people to 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 continue to grow so daniel my final question is the luxury item question which i ask all my guests so if you were stranded on a deserted island and you could only have one single luxury item with you what would that luxury item be? It can't be any form of air or water transportation to get you off that island or anything that requires mobile service so you can call someone to get you off that island. It's just you on this big, lonely island. What would the one single luxury item you would like to have with you? So I knew this question was coming. <laughs> and you're going to you're going to laugh at my first res- my first response when I first heard I, I've it heard was, it all Daniel I've heard it all believe <laughs> me <laughs> well I want to say I was going to actually say because I think my uh Labrador is a luxury item because the way that uh, the, as much money as we end up spending on him I think he's a, he ends up being a uh, a luxury item but I, I I'll, I'll pass on him and I'd probably jump to uh <laughs> Believe it or not, the uh, Grand Wagoneer from Jeep, because once uh, once the battery dies or I'm out of gas or whatever it is, it's a it's a heck of a luxury inside that that vehicle. It'd be it'd be very comfortable for me on that island. Daniel Pigeon, <laughs> Chief Executive Officer of Macintosh Group. Thank you so much for joining me on the luxury item. Thank you. Enjoyed it. That's it for this episode of the Luxury Item Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this useful and entertaining, I would be really grateful if you can share it with a friend or colleague. I would love it if you subscribe so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other listeners find us. The Luxury Item Podcast is a production of Silvertone Consulting. I'm your host, Scott Kerr. Until next time.